Welcome to the Rights Track Podcast, where we aim to get the hard facts about the human rights challenges facing us today. I'm Todd Landman, and in today's episode, we're asking what are the public attitudes towards human rights? My guest is Professor James Ron, who holds the Harold E. Stassen Chair for International Affairs at the University of Minnesota's Humphrey School of Public Affairs and Department of Political Science. James works on the role of local human rights organizations, public opinion and human rights, and is the editor of Open Global Rights, an online blog for a wide range of human rights issues. So Jim, thanks very much for joining us today from Minnesota. We want to talk today about public attitudes towards human rights, and uh, the, this is a really big topic at the moment. We've we found in, in the United Kingdom, certainly, uh, that a lot of attitudes are turning against human rights, that it's popular in certain parts of the press uh, to uh, deride human rights, and uh, there are efforts in uh, the government here uh, to maybe think about uh, rolling back our Human Rights Act, which which really brought the uh, European Convention of Human Rights into uh, domestic law here in the UK. And that's fueled, in a sense, by popular opinion that, that human rights are, are actually some, uh, some sort of entitlement and uh, they only protect people that shouldn't really be protected and they're not appropriate. So I want to talk to you generally about public attitudes towards human rights and then focus a bit more on, on the research you've been doing on a cross-national level. So I wonder if you pick up, when you do your work on public attitudes, uh, the sort of mix between the positive and the negative and what, what people really think about human rights. Well, I think in every population there's going to be a distribution. Some people are, are opposed, some people are supportive, and a lot of people are in the middle. Uh, indeed, my interest in the topic was fueled by a similar debate that took place when I was younger in Israel over human rights. It's, it's similar to the debate that's taking place now in the UK, in which human rights has, has taken on political baggage from surrounding issues and surrounding conflicts and has become a loaded term that means all kinds of things to different people. So growing up in Israel in the 1980s, human rights was one such loaded term. And so when I finally had the money to do research around the world, I was very, very curious to see whether this kind of uh, negative baggage, which I saw in Israel and which you're seeing now in the UK, is true in other parts of the world. And to be frank, I, I didn't find that. So that's really interesting. And maybe we'll start with the basics. Uh, a lot of our guests on uh, the rights track have measured human rights using all sorts of different techniques. And, and I just simply want to know, how do, you, how do you measure attitudes towards human rights? What are the sort of tools that you're using? We're using a face-to-face -face survey. It's a representative surveys that we do nationally in Mexico. In Morocco, India, and Nigeria, we do city-level uh, representative surveys because we didn't have the funds to do national surveys. So in Morocco, we do a Rabat in Casablanca representative sampling, 1,100 uh, respondents with an oversample of rural areas so as to get a sizable rural sample. In uh, India, we did Mumbai and its rural environs, 1,680 persons in face-to-face. -face. And in Lagos, uh, in Nigeria, we did Lagos with uh, 1,000 people face-to-face and the rural environs. Uh, and then, as I said, in, in Mexico, it's a national sample of 2,400 people. So in each of these countries, there is a kind of problem with human rights, which is to say there are, you know, lots of reports about violations of civil and political rights. There are questions of poverty and inequality. There are problems with access to food, education, and welfare, etc. So do you think these four cases are roughly comparable in the sense that they, they're all facing these challenges of development? We, we think they're both comparable and not comparable. They're comparable in the sense that you described, that they all are facing severe human rights challenges. They're also all either democratic or semi-democratic, in as much as there can be vibrant human rights-oriented civil societies in each of these cases. And those civil societies are able to express themselves reasonably openly about a broad range of issues. Not everything, but they can express themselves about a, a broad range of human rights issues. Importantly, the respondents that we talked to felt comfortable telling us what they felt. These are not countries that are so repressive that uh, people would be scared to, to give us their, their views, their frank and, and honest views about human rights issues and organizations. So in that sense, they're all similar. They're very different, obviously, in that they come from different regions of the world, uh, different um, cultures, different languages, different religions. And uh, that's the logic behind the choice of these four cases. They're similar enough so that we can compare them, but they're different enough so that if we find similarities between them, we can say, wow, this is, this is bigger than just these four cases. This, this may be something that's broader. And that's a fascinating point because there is a claim behind, uh, behind human rights that they are universal. Uh, 
Uh, they are inalienable, invaluable, that they're not a Western project, that they're very much uh, the result of a consensus over many, many years and iterations of international meetings and discussions and representations of countries from around the world through the United Nations system, as well as through uh, uh, non-governmental organizations. So it's almost a perfect laboratory for you uh, to say, well, you know, let's test that proposition of the universality or the universal appeal of human rights. Indeed. Um, and to, to be frank, prior to commencing this research, I was known for being on the skeptical side of the human rights camp. I'm a committed human rights scholar and a human rights activist. But at the same time, I've always been somewhat critical of the universalist uh, claim. And I've been critical of human rights organizations saying that they are not particularly well supported by the vast majority of the population and so forth. And, and I went into this study expecting to find that that was true. And, and I was simply surprised and and almost astounded, really, that um, there's much more consensus and much more favorable opinion towards human rights organizations and ideas than I had assumed and that many of us had assumed. So what are some of the stylized findings uh, fr from your project? You know, what sort of percentage of your samples are, or, or you know, you're, you're probably making inferences back to the population. What percentage of your populations do you think are, are supportive of human rights across your four countries? Well, it depends on how you define supportive. Um, a hardcore of supporters, I would say there's uh, probably about 30% in each country. But if you relax the assumptions about what supporters are, it, it grows well over 50%. Let me give you some examples. We have a survey instrument of, of, that goes about 30 to 45 minutes. And one of the questions we ask is, in your opinion, how strongly do you associate, and then we read out a phrase, with the term human rights? And we read out a number of phrases that are positive and that are negative and that are kind of in the middle. So I'll give you an example. We ask, in your opinion, how strongly do you associate protecting people from torture and murder with the word human rights? And the scale is one to seven. So people who don't think that is true at all answer one. And the people who think that's very much true answer seven. And so across our, uh, our four cases, the mean level of association was 5.2 which means that people are very much associating the words human rights with protecting people from torture and murder. We then ask something very negative. To what extent do you associate the words human rights with protecting criminals or protecting terrorists? And across all four countries, the association was very low. It's well below four, the midpoint. And on average, the score was 2.5 for criminals and 2.4 for terrorists. That is, most people do not at all associate the words human rights with protecting criminals or protecting terrorists. And yet, when you ask human rights organizations in these four countries, what does the public think of you? The first thing that comes to their mind is, oh, the public really hates us because they think that we're protecting criminals from being prosecuted by the full extent of the law, or uh, the public hates us because we're protecting people who are really terrorists and should be locked up. Yeah, that's a popular refrain in the, in, in the tabloid press here in the United Kingdom. So. We have a paper called the Daily Mail, for example, and, and often a headline will be something along those lines, right, that, that human rights are there to protect criminals, uh, to protect terrorists, etc. And maybe there's a, there's a kind of bias fueling of that, that general opinion, and yet when you go and do a representative sample survey, you're finding, at least in these four countries, that, that, that that's just simply not the case. Now, I, I wouldn't extrapolate too quickly from these four countries to the UK, because none of these four countries has had a sustained vilification of the human rights movement in the way that the UK has. Um, I think if we conducted these surveys in the UK, perhaps in Russia, perhaps in Israel, perhaps in Zimbabwe, you know, countries where there has been a concerted government effort to really engage in naming and shaming of the human rights community, vilification of the human rights community, the results could be very different. What we're looking at are four countries where human rights are, are contested. There are plenty of negative opinions, but there, in the years that we were doing the study, there was no kind of sustained assault on the human rights community. In Mexico, for example, human rights is very much part of the government's agenda, its official agenda. It has a human rights national commission. The government c continually says it's in favor of human rights. And although some right-wing politicians will say that the human rights community is deeply uh, misguided and that it's protecting criminals too much, it's not government policy to demonize the human rights movement. And I think that's pretty much true for, for the other cases we looked at. So the results could be very different for the UK because the UK has gone through something very special right now. And do you ask questions about trade-offs? So one popular refrain is that, oh, well, there's a, you know, there's a balance between security and freedom. And during periods of threat, uh, 
uh, it's important to uh, you know to cut back on human rights protection. Um, I spoke to security officials in Mexico, and they said human rights sort of get in the way of us doing our job. If we didn't have human rights, we could really go after the criminals. Did you did you have any questions that tried to elicit that that trade off between freedom and security? No, that's in our next round of surveys, which we're starting shortly. Uh, we have a series of trade off questions. We did not in this first round. In the first round, we were trying to get some baseline information on what people, what was their first reaction when they heard the words human rights or heard the words human rights organizations. So, for example, one of the questions we asked is how much trust you have in international and in local human rights organizations in your country. And we discovered reasonably high levels of trust, not as high as trust in religious institutions, but certainly much higher trust uh, than in domestic politicians or in the domestic security forces. So that's one way of comparing, but it's not the trade-off question that you're, you're looking for. That we have in our next round of surveys. So almost as much or more trust in religious institutions followed by trust in human rights, which were uh, greater than the trust in, in governmental institutions. So that's a fascinating kind of hierarchy, if you will, of, of public support. So across all our four countries, average trust on a scale of zero to one, in which one is the most trust and zero is the least trust, Average trust in religious institutions was 0.64. Right. Average trust in politicians was 0.31. And that's the lowest possible. So people mistrust the least at 0.31, and it's politicians that they least trust. And people give the most support on average to religious institutions, and they trust them at 0.64. So the actual range of trust that people express is between 0.31 and 0.64. And local human rights groups come in at 0.52. So they're in the upper third of the revealed trust range. That is, the trust range we ask about is zero to one, but in fact, in reality, people only trust between 0.31 and 0.64, and human rights groups are toward the upper top of that. Up, yeah, uh, the U.S. That government, just to, make a, just to make a comparison, the U.S. government is 0.44, and multinational corporations are 0.43. So human rights groups are doing... Um, a fair bit better than the U.S. government and multinational corporations and also politicians. Now, I'm interested in the, in the religious dimension. Um, did you find any differences across uh, religious identification? The religious section of the book was the hardest to write because the, the findings were so all over the place. So it took me months and months and months to write a coherent book chapter. Uh, what I can say is that across our four cases, Catholics tend to be slightly more trusting of human rights organizations than all other religions which is surprising perhaps if you focus on the Catholic Church and its, and its recent scandals around uh, the sexual abuse of, of young people. But it's not surprising if you re recall that the Catholic Church, ever since the 1960s, has increasingly used the human rights language and made common cause with human rights organizations in Latin America and the Philippines and elsewhere. So Catholics tend to be, four, are, are, are on average, 4% more trusting of human rights groups controlling for a wide range of factors. With liberation theology in the Second Vatican Council, 1968, a lot of the uh, ecclesial-based communities in Latin America, the documentation of human rights abuse in places like Chile, as well as the role of the church in Mexico now, it's not surprising that Catholics might over-identify with human rights. So I, I find that really fascinating. Here's some other interesting findings about religion, is that all religious indicators don't work in the same direction. So for example, if you trust religious institutions more, and if you attend church, temple, or another place of worship regularly, you tend to trust human rights groups less. That is, there's an inverse relationship between those items. Trusting religious institutions more and attending places of worships more is statistically related to less trust in human rights groups. However, personal piety, such as how important religion is in your, in your personal life, um, how often you pray, these types of variables are positively associated with trust in human rights groups. So in as much as, as religiosity can be disaggregated into a kind of a social religiosity and a personal religiosity, there seems to be some evidence that personal piety is more human rights friendly than social religiosity, which I found quite fascinating. And we spent a lot of time trying to figure it out. And we're really challenged by these findings. But we think we've come up with a coherent argument, which is just the one I, I supplied. Yeah, so in a way, it's more about the individuality uh, and the, the individual piety and how that relates to an individual notion of human rights, perhaps. But um, I wanted to turn uh, to Moroccan, the Moroccan case, um, because Morocco was, uh, was sort of proximate to Arab Spring, was involved in constitutional reform. Uh, and in many ways was a quote-unquote easy case of transition and, and a number of things that are taking place there in terms of uh, the king's sponsorship of, uh, of constitutional reform. So I'm curious, 
Uh, did any of that have, do you think, play into uh, the public, public attitudes towards human rights? The strongest effect we had in Morocco was of women's rights, which I think reflects the last 15 years of women's organizing in Morocco. As you may know, women's groups uh, in Morocco in the mid-1990s, late 1990s, became very active around changing the family law so as to be more gender equitable. As a result, people in Morocco tend to identify women's rights with human rights much more strongly than in other countries, far more strongly than in all the other countries. For, for most Moroccans, associating uh, the words human rights really mean women's rights. And when they do feel that way, they trust human rights groups more. So associating human rights with women's rights is not a negative, it's a positive in Morocco. So the strongest uh, Moroccan effect we found was that, was that link to women's rights. The other strong Morocco effect, uh, less strong than, than the women's rights, but still uh, uh, noticeable, was feelings about the United States. In, in Morocco, of the four countries we looked at, negative views of the United States are highest. And when people think of human rights as being linked to uh, the U.S. geostrategic agenda, there's much less support for those human rights groups. So believing that human rights is associated with, with women boosts trust in human rights groups, but believing that human rights is associated with the U.S. national interests or U U.S. foreign policy reduces trust in human rights groups. So there's a bit of like a, one might say an imperial, American imperial effect there, uh, depending on how people uh, position themselves. Yeah, in fact, there is an imperial effect in many countries, and Morocco is the strongest. But it's important to note that as a general rule, people do not identify human rights with America. And that to me was, was fascinating. Across all four countries, we asked, to what extent do you identify promoting U.S. interests with the word human rights? And recall that our association scale is one, I don't associate at all, to seven, which is I associate it very much. And the average was 3.6, which means that in general, people do not associate the human rights agenda with U.S. geopolitical uh, imperialism which is very much contrary to some of the literature we're seeing out now by, by folks such as Stephen Hopkins. Yes, absolutely. And, and so turning attention to India, India is often described as the world's largest democracy, uh, and it is a federal system. So we know that the quality of democracy varies across the states in India. Uh, and also, I think, in reflection to what you said about Morocco and women's rights, there are, women's rights and, and the treatment of women is very much at the, the forefront of headlines uh, in India today. So what are some of the things that you found out in the Indian case? Well, the Indian case was fascinating because women's rights has the direct opposite effect than in Morocco. So in Morocco, if you think that human rights is about women's rights, you support human rights groups. In India, it's the inverse. The more you think that it's about protecting women's rights, the less you support human rights groups. So the notion of women's rights in India appears to be somewhat toxic for the human rights community, whereas a real plus in Morocco. Uh, another interesting finding we found in, in India and not anywhere else was that Getting, if you think that human rights groups get their funding from overseas, you tend to trust them more rather than less. Um, the common assertion out there in the human rights community is that human rights groups are disliked by local populations because they are so dependent on foreign funding, mostly from Europe and America. Uh, and that is true in Morocco, but it's not true in, in Nigeria and in Mexico. There's no effect at all. But in India, it's the reverse. The more you think that uh, foreigners are funding the group, the more you trust them. So I think this reflects the total lack of confidence that people in Mumbai had in their own government and in their own corporations and in, in their own community. There's a, a profound lack of trust in, in India. And so finally, the story in Nigeria. Uh, we know, uh, for example, uh, the story of Shell Oil in Nigeria and the Ogani people and the struggle against um, uh, some of the uh, the treatment of those people and, and the human rights sort of visibility of that, which has been written about quite extensively in literature, certainly around corporate social responsibility, but also a famous book by Clifford Bob called The Marketing of Rebellion talks about that struggle and how it was successful in attracting international attention. Uh, and, and of course, the fascination or at least fixation now on, on uh, Boko Haram in, in, in Nigeria. So um, what, what were sort of the things that you learned about the Nigerian case? Because there's also deep religious division within, the, within that country as well. Right. So uh, the religious differences in Nigeria did not have profound uh, impacts. We, you know, as we, we studied only Lagos, where the population is split between Christian and Muslims, and we didn't find the kind of difference we were expecting to find. So that was interesting. What we did find is that in Nigeria, mistrust in multinational corporations is the highest out of all the four countries. And uh, that is likely due to the story you just told, where the, the Ogonis and the 
shale oil, but more generally exploitation of Nigerian oil by multinationals. So there's, there's pretty strong mistrust in multinationals, but at the same time, much more trust in the U.S. government, which was kind of funny. Uh, Nigeria tends to be a little more trusting of the U.S. government than, than other countries. Nigeria is by far the, the most devout of all the countries we looked at, both Muslim and Christian. Okay. Um, the devotion ranked across all the different indicators is very, very high in Nigeria. And so one conclusion we drew from that is that human rights groups would be really mistaken not to engage with both Christian and Muslim religious communities. This is true in Nigeria. It's true in other countries as well. um, But I think it was particularly true in Nigeria that there simply cannot be a vibrant grassroots human rights movement in Nigeria if there's no engagement with organized religion. It just it just won't fly. Uh, And one of the things we also found is that the human rights activists that we interviewed in Nigeria are themselves more devout than in other countries. In other countries, about half the the human rights activists are devout and half are not. In Nigeria, I think about 90% of them uh, self-identified as devout. So uh, religion is important everywhere, but it's particularly true in Nigeria. Interestingly, we did not find in Nigeria that people felt that the human rights movement was about protecting terrorists or criminals. Um, With the advent of Boko Haram and and all the press around that, that was one of our biggest um, expectations, that we would find that In Nigeria, people thought of human rights as protecting Boko Haram, and that we just didn't find any evidence for that. So I think our biggest our biggest finding is that there is a gap between what scholars think people think, and even between what human rights activists think that people think, and what people actually think. Um, People actually tend to think relatively positively of human rights, and a lot of the fears that we have about what the public thinks just are not borne out in our data. It may be that we're not asking the questions in the right way. It may be that our surveys are flawed, and so we're, we're doing new rounds of surveys and trying to get at it better. But part of the story is that the human rights world has been very much immersed in, its, in a debate with other elites, scholars, politicians, political activists who are very articulate and very angry about things, uh, religious leaders. And we, and I include myself in this, haven't spent a lot of time talking with normal people. And our data bear this out, that the, the rate of contact between human rights personnel and ordinary population is very, very low. The human rights community is getting a very skewed view of what ordinary people think of it. It's getting a view that is very much informed by the most articulate, the loudest, and the most vociferous debates. It's not informed by what ordinary people think about in their daily lives. And I think that's that's one of the things that we bring to the table is, is the beginning of an insight into the mass opinion of human rights. I think there's much, much more work that needs to be done. I think our work can be done better. Our work can be more precise. It can include more countries. This needs to be replicated and extended. But I think we've opened the door to a more systematic study of mass opinion and human rights. I think this is extraordinary. And to identify that gap between what we think we know and what we actually know from the kind of work that you're doing is, is absolutely the point of doing this kind of work. And, uh, and it's, it's, a, it's a good news story in the end, really, for you. So um, my final question for you, uh, Jim, today is uh, uh, what's the name of the book and when does it come out? Well, there's still some debate over the name of the book. Uh, I have um, co-authors and uh, we're still arguing over what the name is going to be. But we think it's going to be called Diffusing Rights the human rights word and its messengers. And uh, we're using the, the, we play throughout the book on this notion of word and messengers. The word is the human rights word and the messengers are the human rights groups. And I expect it to come out in 2017 with uh, Oxford University Press. That's fantastic. So it just leaves me to say uh, thank you very much for joining us today on this episode of The Rights Track. Thanks again. Thank you. This episode of The Rights Track was presented by Todd Landman and produced by Chris Carrington of Research Podcasts. The podcast project is funded by the Nuffield Foundation and you can find additional information and resources at www.rightstrack.org.